Welcome to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast, where we explore the spirituality of the Christian child through the method of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. I am your host, Carrie Mecki Lozano. In this time that we are currently living in, when atria are closed, formation courses for Catechesis of the Good Shepherd are closed, and even our liturgical gatherings themselves are canceled. During this holiest time of the year, how do we as Christians live Easter this year? How do we prepare for this memorial of Christ's death and resurrection? In this episode, Anne Garrido and I discuss these questions using this past week's foglietto or little note in Italian as our guide. If you are a member of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd USA, you can access the full text of this folletto in the members section of our website. I have also included a small part of this folletto in the show notes. My prayer for this episode is that it brings you hope during this time of confusion. I hope that it brings you direction and inspiration during this time of Eucharistic fasting, especially as we are drawing near and near to Easter. Welcome everybody to the Good Shepherd and the Child podcast. We have Anne Garrido here. Welcome, Anne. Hey, Carrie. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Anne, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Ah, um, well, I'm Anne Garrido. I'm a catechist of the Good Shepherd. Uh, I think I started in 1995, and I've served as a formation leader for um, most of that time in addition to being a catechist. Uh, And I'm on the faculty at Aquinas Institute, where I teach pastoral theology, and I've um, been part of the MAPS, uh, the Master's in Pastoral Studies program for Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. And one of my areas of particular interest has been looking at sort of the history of our movement and some of the theological sources that underpin the work that we do with children. And you have helped to spearhead the the heritage course that you also have at the Aquinas Institute Yeah, that dives into those, those deep theologians that have guided this movement. And you're also an author of many books as well. (laughs) I am. That's kind of my day job. (laughs) <laughs> um, so yeah, I do a lot of work in, in conflict mediation and conversation, um, around difficult conversations. And I, my most recent one that I just have out is called let's talk about truth. So mm-hmm. it's about recovering the concept of truth as a, as a, what's it, what would it look like to live truth at our moment in history? Hmm. Very cool. And you also have a book of, of daily reflections about, um, Sophia Cavaletti. Is that correct? I do. Yeah. So a year with Sophia Cavaletti, we published it for her 100th birthday um, as a way of having all of her friends, those living and and those who have passed on, uh, to celebrate together and look at how um, the kind of these Sophia's theological friends and also her friends in terms of child development and friends in her real life, how they can help us also to... um, live our ministry with children well um, in this in this time too. That's really cool. That's a really cool way to, to meditate on this movement. Um, so it, we'll put a, a link to those books in our show notes if anybody is interested to those books. Oh, that's great. But this week we received a little note from Italy, a foglietto. Two weeks ago, we received one that Mary and I talked about in the past episode, but just this past week, we received another one. Francesca, she posed a question at the very end that was particularly moving. The go and prepare the Passover meal that Jesus told to his disciples. The disciples asked Jesus, where do you want us to prepare for it? And she lifts up how in Greek, it can be translated to how do you want us to prepare for the Passover meal? And she says that each one of us need to ask this question now. How do we prepare for this feast now? How should we get ready? After reading this, how do you feel, Anne? How do you feel called to prepare? 
I did. I just found that a very powerful question to be asking at this time and taking for myself into prayer. How am I supposed to get ready to celebrate Mm -hmm. um, the memorial of Christ's death and resurrection this year? And two things that really leapt out to me from the Folietto, um, one was especially from the early part of the Folietto, what Patrizia says about the importance of the word of God right now. Um, I would say, especially in the highly sacramental traditions that most of us who are catechists come out of, we've placed a tremendous emphasis on um, the the bread and wine of, of mm-hmm. Eucharist, the sacrament of Eucharist. Uh, it's kind of interesting, though, that this year Pope Francis declared in the, the, the third Sunday in ordinary time every year from henceforth, beginning this year, would be Word of God Sunday. And he reminds us that when we gather to celebrate liturgically with one another, um, in in Eucharist, there's the table of the Eucharist. There's also the table of the word. And this is a table that we share in common with our brothers and sisters of various different Christian traditions. And also a good portion of the scriptures we share with our Jewish brothers and sisters Mm -hmm. as well. And he calls all of us to reground ourselves to be people of the word. And that, that that's also a place where God reveals God's very being to us. We meet the face of God through the word mm-hmm. of God. And the more deeply we study the word and marinate in that word and sit in that word and meditate on that word, we come to have an experience, a very deep and profound experience of God there mm-hmm. too. Um, and uh, Patricia talks about, I think for her, maybe sitting in some of the moral parables that she's mm-hmm. been sitting with. She's obviously from the Folietto thinking about the parable of the Good Shepherd, the parable of the Pharisee, the parable of the Precious Pearl, um, and doing so in such a way that she's finding God there. And I would say, me too. Um, this past year, I had the tremendous gift of getting to make an Ignatian 30-day exercises oh, wow. retreat. And of getting to really sit in the word of God for 30 days. And it taught me how to pray with scripture in a way that I just had never experienced Mm -hmm. before. And so for me during Lent right now, that's been part of what I'm doing is just taking one small passage each day and imagining myself within it and sitting it actually like we do in the atrium with the children, inviting them to copy it by Mm -hmm. hand. Because sometimes when I copy scripture by hand, new words pop out or I hear phrases in different ways. And just having a, having a conversation with Christ about um, what it is that I'm hearing in the word and asking God to speak to me and reveal to me what I'm supposed to know. Sometimes drawing and doing free artwork for myself, mm-hmm. just like a child would do in the atrium. This has been a really beautiful way of entering into the season for me. Um, so the word of God is definitely one of the ways in which I think we can celebrate Christ's memorial right now, draw closer to him. Yeah, I think it's going to be a time where, um, us as individual Christians, as we approach Easter and as we are celebrating Easter, we are really going to have to take it on ourselves to, to be active, to celebrate, to do what is necessary in order for us to really honor this celebration, that this memorial that we are all still celebrating, even though that we are not able to physically go to come together as community and celebrate together with mass. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're all just going to have to have discipline and initiative in order to do what you're saying of really diving into the scripture and putting ourselves there and falling in love with Jesus by spending time with his word in that way. And I think when we keep talking about even just the idea of celebrating, it doesn't necessarily mean when we think celebrating liturgically, it doesn't mean the same thing as sometimes celebrating means in wider culture mm-hmm. when we hear celebrating like balloons and party. <laughs> that at the deepest level, celebration means a deep living of and lifting up. Um, and that's the other thing which comes across so clearly in this particular folieto is, and this is more difficult maybe to describe. But one of the things the Second Vatican Council called the church to, and you can hear it in the documents of the council over and over again, is to read the signs of the times and to figure out what is God doing in the history of our time. And that is that um, 
that is not always so easy to do. But both Patricia and Francesca in this document um, use that phrase, the signs of the mm -hmm. times. And asking us to read, what is God doing in history right now? And how do the Christian scriptures, and particularly what happened in Jesus' death and resurrection, sort of serve like a key to the map? They give us um, the code to be able to read history mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now and to recognize that God is found both profoundly in um, the mystery of death and in the mystery of of resurrection and that these two can't be separated from each other and that what we're trying to when we gather together liturgically um one of my favorite here's a thing about that comes from a theologian father michael hines he says what's true always and everywhere has to be celebrated sometimes somewhere yeah. and uh in mass we're celebrating what's true always and everywhere, which is that God is alive and active and present in the daily life and the rhythm and the flow of the world. And to the degree at this moment in time that we can deeply sink into solidarity with our brothers and sisters all over the earth and what it is that we are all going through right now. So not to try to ignore it, not to try to entertain our way out of it, not to just um, keep watching more and more YouTube videos or more and more like spending more and more time online, mm -hmm. but to sink deeply into some of the silence of the world right now and to recognize that one of the things that we're being asked to do almost is to live deeply in extended silence or Sabbath of um, can I create more space in my day that I don't right now actually need to fill up with noise. I don't need to fill up with watching more mm -hmm. of having the TV on 24 hours a day, but allowing myself to live in time and to look outside the window and to see what is happening in the world right now. Definitely to stay informed about what's going on in the bigger scene and to bring it into prayer, to allow myself to feel grief over mm -hmm. that to also allow myself to feel God's presence in the middle of it um, and to not deny myself what I'm feeling, but to learn how to be in that moment, be here mm -hmm. now. Yeah. That makes me think about what Patricia talked about with that master of space and master of time that usually we are the master of space and we're able to go wherever we want to go. But at this time we are not masters of space, we, but we, we right. can share this master of time with God where like what you're talking about is we have this time in front of us that we usually are moving too fast to have. How are we going to spend that time? How are we going to, to use this time in order to help us grow? And she, she points out about the, the precious pearl and how it helps us with the with discernment, that indirect aim of to help with discernment. We have to discern for ourselves how we are going to use it in order to build the kingdom or to stay stagnant. This is that whole idea of the blank page that is right in front of us. And what are we going to write on this blank page that we, this is part of the history. Yes, this isn't what we planned for part of the history. This is, has caught us all off guard, but it is God is speaking in this history right now. And how are we going to move forward on our blank page right in front of us? Yeah, I, I know when Patrizia is using that language, what I hear underneath it is she's drawing from the writing of one of Sophia's favorite writers, mm -hmm. who is Abraham Heschel, mm -hmm. um, who speaks a lot about space and time and the relationship between the two. And he talks about particularly in the end, time also only belongs to God and uh we have to figure out how do we, it's kind of the question, how do we master ourselves in time? Because at some level, we'll never master time, but how do we master ourselves in time? Mm -hmm. And he talks about how six days a week, we as human beings, part of our vocation as humans is to transform the earth and to help build it up into the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. But within Jewish tradition, um, and something that all of us are continued to be invited to observe, is to recognize uh in Jewish tradition, 
each week there's a day of Sabbath, which is a day of resting and remembering that despite all of our efforts, in the end, this is God's history that God is writing. And yes, with human hands, but that it's God's history and that we are um, we, we are to enter into a rest of knowing that it is ultimately in God's hands mm. and God's control beyond ours. And sometimes when stuff like this happens, there's a little bit, at least internally with me, like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Mm-hmm. And I guess right now, being definitely in my own apartment space and not being able to leave it as an act of love for other people, a uh, part of it isn't always what can I do, but who can I be in the midst of this space? And is there an invitation right now, like I was saying, even to more silence, even to more study, to more deep conversation with other people um, using Zoom or FaceTime or just my phone to call people who I really care about and to talk about things that really matter Mm -hmm. and not to let this be yet again another time of frazzle, Um, but could we simplify? Could we do with less? Could I be eating less, not having so much, you know, like, <laughs> could, could everything just become a little bit simpler again and reground me in what's essential? That's what CGS has always done. It's uh, called me back to the most essential stuff so that I don't get lost in frazzle. And it feels to me like this season is like a whole atrium season. That's a really beautiful way to look at it. Calling us to more essentiality and what truly is um, our purpose and what truly is our call. Patricia also talks about the parable of the Pharisee here from Luke's parable. She says, perhaps we had thought a lot like the Pharisee in Luke's parable, that we ourselves were enough, that we were at the center of history, that what was important for us was not the mustard seed. That is essential for God. And just as in the desert, God educated his people So perhaps we must today let ourselves be educated by God and see that his love is the love of the father who corrects and adjusts our vision while always supporting us. That makes me think about what you were just talking about, that maybe God is using this time, of course, not creating the darkness, but he's using it in order to help us embrace the Sabbath, embrace our true purpose, embrace this essentiality that will help create parousia that will bring peace and love. I suspect so. Yeah. Because I remember one of the practices that at least I was taught very early in atrium life was each year at the beginning of the year, walk through the atrium and ask, what more could I get rid of from here? Like what more could, what more Mm. could we let go of that's not essential for this space? And right now I find myself even doing that in my own apartment. (laughs) <laughs> and with my schedule, because I thought there were a lot of really essential things on my schedule. And it turns out, oh, they were not quite as essential as I thought they were. The world is living fine without mm. me doing them right now. Um, and in my own space, like what what is not really necessary for this space? Um, and all of the multitudinous you know, connections that I've got our relationships that I'm trying to juggle it all the time, maybe not all of them are as essential as I thought that they were. So how it, it helps us to come in contact with what's deepest and truest. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe for many of us who are in our homes right now, reconnecting with our families at a very, very deep level. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's part of the preparation that we are being called to at this time. Is that yeah. walking around internally and externally and um, finding what is most essential and discarding the rest. Maybe that is part of this Easter preparation that we can embrace yeah. It's kind of like all of us are seeds putting, being resting in soil right now mm. and seeing what will happen. What will happen? I, I think that at the very end of the little note, um, let's see if I can find exactly. She talks about that question of how should we prepare that each one of us is going to have to ask and get the answer to because it's going to be different for each one of us. How should we prepare Mm -hmm. for this Easter season? How do you want us to prepare Jesus? Um, Each one of us needs to ask that question. And each one of us is going to have a different response based on what, whatever it is that God is needing for us in our lives at that time. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's a, I, I love that at the end, she draws our attention to the phrase, the, the word, this, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. from the, um, when Jesus says in the Last Supper, do this in memory of me. One of the biggest questions of all of history, I think, has been is, what does the this mean? <laughs> and one of the things, obviously, it could mean celebrate my presence with you forever in this way, in the bread and the wine. But the this also means do this, like be broken in memory of mm -hmm. me, uh, lay down your life in memory of me. That's what we're seeing healthcare providers all over the globe doing mm -hmm. right now, first responders doing everywhere. And, and each of us in our own way, even just by for myself, part of like keeping myself isolated right now is part mm -hmm. of a way, hopefully an act of love for other people. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, be broken for me um, and then rise for me ascend for me like these are all ways in which in daily life this is the way that we live the memorial mm -hmm. there was one of the authors uh mark searle was a theologian from university of notre dame who wrote one of the prefaces to an early version of religious potential of the child and he he says about the celebration of liturgy in particular um he says if we were to learn from the celebration of Eucharist, from the celebration of the Paschal Mystery, to surrender our lives totally to God in Christ, uh, he says then that for each of us, when we die, the death of the Christian would be, he says, the further and final rehearsal of a pattern of life that's been learned and practiced over and over again over a whole lifetime of liturgical participation. Mm. Because those of us who've learned from the prayers and the rituals of Christian liturgy how to let go to everything that we cling to to save ourselves mm -hmm. uh, from the void, uh, the final surrender of death is going to be a familiar and a joyous sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And that's what it, it feels to me like in this time, each of us is learning how to live Paschal mystery in our lives in such a way that it's preparing us for a final letting go that each and every one of us will do. Um, and it's like we're practicing that into being. I remember hearing that quote in my first level one training. <clears throat> it was part of our formation and it had a really profound impact on me. This idea that um, a series of deaths throughout our life and then our final death is just another death. And it's, it's exactly what we're talking about right now, like how you're talking about living more essentially and um, discarding all the things in our life that are not essential. That is the dying to self, the dying to self, to this the essentiality, the letting go of all of these things that are not bringing us closer to God, the um, letting them die in some respects in our life and how that's drawing us deeper and closer into Jesus's death, Jesus's death, saying no to ourselves or saying no to things that we normally would have put into our lives, both physically and emotionally and mentally. And, and like how you were saying of staying home, all of those ways. But then there's also like you were talking about with connecting with the people in your lives and how now you have this time mm -hmm. and space to connect with the people in your life. That is also, that is also the, this, that we were talking mm -hmm. about um, building and being the body of Christ in that way and showing love yeah. to the people around us that this, that we're always called to not even just in this time, we're always called to the, do this in memory of me outside of the mass. And I think that now maybe is the time where we can focus on those things. And then hopefully whenever we are able to celebrate the mass again in a more physical way that we can are able to continue it even deeper that this of how do we do this in memory outside of the mass being the body in Christ and spreading, spreading that love throughout our lives. Yeah. It's our lifetime of practice. It's our lifetime of practice of the mass that is giving us the um, key to the map that we're walking right now yeah. as a church. Yes. So it's taught us what we need to do. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's almost like the test. <laughs> We've been practicing our yeah. whole life. Okay, now, guys, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we still be the body of Christ? Can we continue to go? Because the Mass is still being celebrated. We are still connected to it all. Oh, yeah. It's just we're physically not able to be there. So can we can we manifest it outside of the church? Can we do that, guys? 
Um, one of Sophia's other theologians that she draws on a good deal in her own writing is Pierre, uh, Thierry mm -hmm. de Chardin, who is a French theologian. And he has a beautiful, beautiful book. Maybe we'll want to link this one too, called The Mass mm -hmm. on the World. And it talks about how when he, because of the work that he did, he was a paleontologist out in the middle of China, in the desert of China. He speaks about during a time when he wasn't able to celebrate mass, um, what it meant to him to every day of his life, offer his daily life, all of the stuff of his life in which um, all the, all the ways in which he was working on behalf of the kingdom of God to build up the kingdom of God and all the things that were going on in his life that felt like it was coming apart and all the ways in which he felt like he was coming unhinged. Um, he would say he would lay all of that before God in prayer and, and allow Christ to say over it, all of this is my body, mm. all of this is my blood. Um, and let it become um, part of what it is that, like how do we unite our daily lives to what Christ offered mm -hmm. of his life? and allow it to become one great gift of thanksgiving and, and praise to God, both the beauty of it and the struggle mm -hmm. of it, um, and to allow God to consecrate yeah. all of it. I think it takes a, a being conscientious of the, our each moments. Um, mm -hmm. a, a dear friend of mine, Gabrielle Perez, I had her on the podcast a few episodes ago. She talked about how whenever she goes into her Montessori classroom, she lights candles around the classroom and, it reminds her that this work that she is about to do is her gift. This is her offering. And so then throughout the day, her work is her prayer. And so I think it takes at this time, it's the intentionality. It's the, the bringing our minds to the idea that whatever I am doing today, I giving it to you. This is my offering. And throughout the day, constantly being aware of that mindset that all these negatives, all these positives, all my goods, all my bads, all my um, successes and failures, I am offering this up in, in union what Jesus has offered on the cross. I think it takes an intentional yeah. um, practice of the mind in order to make us conscious of that reality that we can <sighs> offer it all on the yeah. altar, even without physically being near it. Mm -hmm. um, there was one part of the little note that um, particularly spoke to me, Francesca talked about at this time when it is forbidden for so many of God's people to live it, meaning the mass, um, it pleases me to help to remember and meditate on the profound meaning of the Eucharistic celebration. Um, I, I think for me, this is my answer to the Jesus, how should we prepare? How should we prepare it? For me, mm -hmm. I think it's the meditating on the profound meaning of the Eucharistic celebration. So at this time, if I <clears throat> spend time pondering this profound mystery that we encounter on a, a weekly or not daily basis, um, helping me to unite myself with that celebration in that way that is taking place that I'm not able to physically be there, but uniting myself by pondering that crazy mystery and it's the mystery of the history of salvation, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we, I mean, what we've been talking about right now is meditating on the mystery <laughs> of what lies underneath the mass, that what's true always and everywhere is what we celebrate in the mass, but it's true always and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so when we're pondering deeply on how God is present in daily life mm -hmm. and what God's doing in the world, saving the world, mm -hmm. that is what we're celebrating mm -hmm. in that moment. I gather in liturgy. And it's so deep. It's so deep. It's just, there's layers. We um, could spend many time in court, <laughs> many, many months of quarantine, sending, spending time pondering the mystery of, of what all of the, the mass and the Eucharist and that deep memorial means both inside and yeah. outside of the mass. Well, and um, before we finish, is there anything else that you would like to add or share with everybody? No, I just say, Carrie, thank you for being one of the ways that's linking the body of Christ during this time. Thank you for being you and for bringing your gifts to bear in this moment in history. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your gifts as well, Anne. Thank you so much for listening today. In our show notes, you can look for all the different links 
that Anne and I talked about, we have included many, many links for further reflection for you. We hope that these aid you in being able to answer that question, how do you want us to prepare? If you choose to purchase any of the resources that we have on our website, know that in doing that, you are supporting the work of CGS USA and we thank you. On the CGS USA website, we have many, many resources that we have created for families and individuals to use during this pandemic. Please go to the cgsusa.org website and click on the top where it says COVID-19 and you will be able to find an abundance of resources. Please feel free to share those with anyone who might benefit from them. We would love for you to join us every other Wednesday. And so subscribe to our podcast. Please tell your friends about this podcast. Share it on social media. Um, You can find this podcast anywhere where you can find podcasts. Leave a comment and a rating. We read every single one and it helps us tremendously. Tell us what you think, your ideas. You can also email us at cgs at cgsusa.org. You can also keep up with us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I've put our names for each of those platforms into our show notes. This podcast is sponsored by the United States Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd. So we want to thank all of the contributing members of the association because of you that this podcast is possible. If you want to know more about Catechesis of the Good Shepherd, or if you would like to become a member, you can go to cgsusa.org. Thank you so much for joining us this week. We will see you in two weeks. Go and fall more deeply in love with God.